Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch Produce Market and Garden Center, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to the show today. We are looking forward to talking to you about whatever you're interested in. Uh, I suspect we'll talk a little bit about heat and drought and things, but maybe we can actually start some upbeat talk about fall coming. And I know it doesn't seem like it, but it is. Trust me, it is. Uh, if you will get a pen and write down our phone number, you can give us a call at 845-5689. For those of you outside the area, it's 979-845-5689 or garden success at tamu. Dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu and we have a few questions by email that we're going to talk about today uh, so I want to start off with a question uh, from Mary and it comes with a photo and if you can imagine a melon like foliage like a cantaloupe or a cucumber or something like that uh, with little round um, I go lemon like colored uh, melons on it, something maybe size of a tennis ball or smaller, and uh, they're yellow and uh, very unusual. What is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> melons are melons are one of those plants that is pretty promiscuous. When you start crossing the various kinds of squashes or different kinds of melons, you can get a lot of strange combinations in there, and uh, that often happens. So it's one possibility is it's just across uh, between some things. There are some cucumbers that have uh, yellow fruit like that. That is that is one possibility. There's one called a lemon cucumber uh, or lemon, yeah, and it it uh, it has round um, and very yellow, bright yellow fruit. Now when you cut into it, you don't expect to smell citrus just because the name says lemon. It's They call it that because it sort of looks like that, uh, but not bumpy. Uh, surface, very smooth surface, like you would expect more of a, of a cucumber. Uh, but that's a possibility. It could be a lemon cucumber. Another thing is there there is something that's it's kind of obscure. You don't see it much, but it's called a vine peach. And uh, it's a different, it's in the same genus as cucumbers, but but a different species. And in fact, it's, it's in the same genus and species as some of our uh, cantaloupes and muskmelons, things like that, uh, but a different group within that species. The vine peach, when you cut into it, if that's what you've got, it's going to have either a peach or a mango kind of aroma inside. So that'll be a real quick way to know if you're, if you're dealing with that one. Uh, but it's going to be one of those two, Mary, or just some volunteer that uh, you know where a couple of different plants crossed and now you're getting the offspring in the seed and maybe that happened in the garden or maybe you purchased some seeds and uh, you know something other than what you purchased uh, got into the packet that's unlikely but it's all always possible so we'll throw that throw that in as a possibility our number is 845-5689 845-5689 or by email garden success at t-a-m-u dot e-d-u and let's go to the phones now and talk to mike hello mike hey skip how are you doing i'm well thank you how are you <laughs> i'm doing good i i'm calling you i called you about this maybe a year ago and you gave me an answer and now i have another question that, that's related i I got a um, a temporary uh, uh, a temporary garden in my front yard to get more sun, and I got some compost and mulch from some from Lowe's, some from Producers Co-op. 
I planted onions and I planted tomatoes. Mm-hmm. They came up with uh, a lot of like mushrooms in the compost. Okay. And, and they didn't do very well. And I sent them to you and you, you looked at them and gave me an answer about them. And so that didn't work out very well. So I brought all of that down, took all that down, and then I put that compost in my garden last year, or whatever that combination was. Okay. And my and my garden didn't do very well. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm wondering if that compost said some of that compost had a herbicide or something in it. Um, well, uh, that, boy, that's a that's a can of worms. But I'll I'll try to answer, Mike. I'm not going to be able to give you a definitive answer because. The, there's several possibilities out there, uh, and okay. I'm going to an- I'm going to answer a little bit broader question than you're actually asking, just because some other people are going to have similar kinds of things uh, that they're wondering about on this. Um, so when when um, ranchers take care of their grass pastures for making hay or grazing cattle, uh, some mm-hmm. of the products that can be used to keep down not just brush but also things like ragweed and other other broadleaf uh, weeds in the pasture. Uh, can be very persistent. Not all of them, but but some of them. And some are so persistent that when the cattle grazes on the pasture, the manure out of the cattle is um, tainted with that product. And so uh, you then put it, you can even compost it and then put it in the garden and there's still some there. So there's Mm -hmm. always that possibility. That would also be true if you use a mulch maybe that's cut hay from a pasture like that that's the most likely place we get it uh, okay. so so that that would be one possibility if you bought it in a bag I, I don't I don't think that's a likelihood that that's what's mm-hmm. doing it but it, we got to leave the realm of possibility because there's a lot of companies putting a lot of stuff in bags and and I'm yeah. not I'm not at each one asking them where they're getting their raw materials for that so uh, th- that's a possibility another and more likely, problem is a lot of times when compost gets made commercially when bed mixes get put together commercially you know where Mm -hmm. you buy something and it's got compost and maybe mushroom mulch and it's got uh, a mushroom compost and it's got uh, soil all mixed together in it for your beds those are great products but a lot of times they come in and they need time um I, I don't have a better word for it other than to mellow. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a, that's not a very scientific uh, term. But I've just noticed that a lot of new bed mixes, it may be that the nitrogen is very tied up, or it may be mm-hmm. that there's some other nutrient that's kind of in an imbalance. And when you've got a lot of carbonaceous material like wood chips or other things that are mm-hmm. part of the mix, uh, things can kind of be out of whack for a while because there's a lot of things that happen microbial in the soil and when they get out of whack, we sometimes have problems. And, and I've noticed that if, you, if you're patient, those garden beds tend to improve. It may be the mm-hmm. second season before you start to see a little improvement. And that's not to say every bed mix causes that, but I see it probably 80% of the time we, we have problems with plants coming up and they don't seem to have much vigor and you're, tra- you're doing mm-hmm. everything right, you know how to garden, and uh, that, that could be part of it. And I would just recommend adding a little extra nitrogen to try to speed that process up a little bit uh, as kind of being the remedy. Uh, So I don't know if any of that seem more or less likely as you're looking at your garden, but those are some Well, Yeah, the compost had some woody kind of pulpy stuff in it, uh, like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But when I had the temporary 4x4 garden in the front yard a year ago, Mm -hmm. uh, I dug all that up, and there... there was no grass on that spot for a long time. Over a year later, it's only about half covered <laughs> where that spot was. And, and that's, you know, we had a lot of rain in the fall and the spring, and that it's still not covered. So I, I think there was something in there that was, I don't hmm. know what it was. but uh, Well, that's unusual. It, yeah. Have, have you, anyway. That wasn't where like an old burn pile was years ago or no. anything like that? Hmm. No, it wasn't, wasn't anything there. It was just uh, ground that hadn't been been mowed and just part of the yard for yeah. twenty something years or more. But uh, well, I'll try. I'll I'll dig up that really good uh, well this year and put some mm-hmm. nitrogen in it, and we'll see if it does better. Then. Yeah, and so. if you got any of the mix and stuff left over, of course, a lot of those mixes are kind of chunky. And you know, if I'm if I'm doing yeah. a garden, I generally don't want to go with a really chunky mix because yeah. you're planting seeds and things in your vegetable garden. Uh, and chunky makes it hard to plant them at the right depth and get good contact with the soil. 
Uh, if you're growing a big rose bed or, you know, something like mm -hmm. that, then the chunky is fine. Uh, you know, those are a little bit better. But you might take a little bit of that stuff and put it in a, put it in a little Dixie cup, punch some holes in the bottom and plant a seed or two. And just okay. see how they grow and how they look coming up in there. Okay. Uh, and maybe you'll, yeah. you may notice good or bad, but maybe that'll kind of help a little bit. Okay. 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 Well, that sounds good. Appreciate your help. Thank you. All right, Mike. Thank you for the call. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Our number is 845 5689 for those outside the area, 979 845 5689. Uh, email garden success one word garden success at t a m u dot e d u garden success at t a m u dot e d u uh, let's see we've got a, um, a question that came in uh, from Shelby and it's a picture of some post oak leaves and there is some white stuff on them. There are kind of spots and things. It's definitely on top of the leaf, not white in the leaf. Uh, and, and they have a, a cottony look to them, too. And my first thought when I looked at it was, well, maybe that's a, a, a mealybug because mealybugs have a whitish appearance. But when you get to all that cottony stuff, it takes us in a different direction. And this is something called woolly aphids. That's a good name for it, isn't it? Uh, woolly aphid. They look very woolly. Normally we see aphids and they're slick and you know definitely no wool on them. Uh, that's the normal aphid you've encountered but there is a, such a thing called woolly aphids. In fact there's many kinds of woolly aphid. On hackberries you will see something we call the Asian woolly aphid and again you look at the hackberry leaf and there's these little specks or spots but they're real cottony looking uh, and that that would be a hackberry woolly aphid. We see those a lot around here uh, but Woolly aphids are a common thing, especially on post oak in the in the later part of the summer. You know, aphids are sucking some juices out of the leaves and so on, but it just doesn't warrant control. It's not putting any kind of a risk uh, or a, a heavy drain on that plant's resources, and I would ignore it and not worry about it. If you want to get a hose end spray, you know, and I mean just water and just blast some leaves off, uh, that can be done. That that works pretty well, and you'll dislodge the vast majority of them. Uh, you can certainly do that, uh, but as far as needing to mix up a poison to spray on them and kill them, that, that is not, not needed, not necessary. But thank you for that, that call or that uh, email there there's you know I love the photos that come with emails because they really they really help answer the question I don't know how many times someone has asked me a question and in my mind's eye I'm I'm picturing a certain thing and then I get the picture and it's something totally different than what I was picturing and so questions that uh, can be attached with a photo are really really good also for some some types of things I think it was last week we had a question came in from Suzanne and uh, there are there's a plants with kind of there's some missing foliage but there's a web-like material almost like little bags of webbing and stuff like that and there's little black dots in the in the webbing little uh, not pepper flake size but uh, little black things all in the webbing and what that is is that's a uh, caterpillar frass which is frass is our nice scientific term for poop uh, but uh, caterpillar frass uh, is caught up in the webbing. There, caterpillars can make webs. Uh, spiders make webs. They're not the only thing that makes webs. Caterpillars can do that. And as they're feeding on your leaves, uh, that leaf material is coming out the back end of the caterpillars, little, little dots of frass. And when I looked at the picture, I can see that uh, the damage is old. Uh, you know, you can see when a caterpillar has been feeding overnight and you get up in the morning, go look at your garden, you can tell if damage is fresh or if the edges that have been eaten are already, you know, a little tan line around them. So, so this has had time for that freshly wounded edge to dry up a little bit. Uh, and so when you see old damage, that means you don't need to do anything. Uh, you can you can go on and not worry about it. Those caterpillars are long gone. They tend to run their their life cycle and then they're off to the next life stage. Uh, some of them return back again for a, another uh, um, venture through your garden that year. But in general, don't worry about it. They're nothing to worry about. I think uh, caterpillar frass. Uh, something that was a real, uh, an, an amusing surprise to me the first time I learned this, but uh, there are actually, uh, there's actually a specialty within entomology 
where you learn to identify the culprit based on the frass. Uh, caterpillars have different types of digestive tracts and uh, body parts, and I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, you just tried to have lunch, so I'll let I'll let it go at that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you can actually look at the ridgings and the markings in the frass to determine what caterpillar it came from if you're really good. Now, why on earth would anybody want to know that? Well, uh, one reason why is when you're doing forensic entomology. Maybe, you know, you've been called in as a forensic entomologist and they're trying to determine uh, was this uh, was this person killed here or were they killed somewhere else and brought here and what, you know, maybe it's long after the crime and you're trying to figure out when did they, when did they, uh, when were they killed, when was the body there. And entomologists uh, can come in and because insects go through cycles and uh, the different parts that insects leave behind can, can differ, they can actually help solve the crime. Isn't that interesting? A scatological uh, uh, crime solver. Uh, let's go to the phones now and talk to Ron. Hello, Ron. Hey, Skip. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. Uh, from your recommendation, about a year ago, I planted a, uh, I guess it's called a Mexican white oak. Yes. And uh, I wanted to try to plant something different besides a, a live oak. And it, it, it's done really well. Uh, I bought a 30-gallon tree. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, about three weeks ago, I had a uh, a water pipe bust mm -hmm. that was very near the tree well, and it, it flooded the whole area. Okay. And I didn't know it for probably a day or two. Uh huh. So the tree is the tree has turned completely brown now. All the oh. leaves. Okay. And they're not they're not and they're not dropping. They're they're still. Which I know it typically is a, not a good sign for that. Yeah. Uh, do you think I should? Uh, I mean, I'm not looking to take it out right this, this right. weekend, but yeah. Do you think I should just, do you think it's gone? I'd give it some time, but you are correct in that, you know, when a tree drops leaves, it may well bounce back. Uh, that's just part of the, hey, I got to survive, and these leaves are losing water, and I don't got any water, so we drop them off. When a tree d it has bread uh, or has brown leaves that are, that are hanging, that usually isn't a good sign uh, that it may not come back. Um, now, in the heat of summer, you know, and with all the drought, people think, well, why would water kill a tree? Well, it's because lack of oxygen in the root system. And when the demands are the highest they can be, number one, you want moist soil, but number two, if you can't get oxygen to the roots, that tree will die faster than, than a drought-stricken tree will. And so that may be the end result on that tree, but I wouldn't give up on it yet. Let's give it a little more time. Uh, if you dig down in the soil, hopefully there's not still a water table there, uh, you know, from where that hole filled up with water. Uh, but uh, it may bounce back, uh, but it, I, I wouldn't bet money on it, but I definitely would not give up on it yet. So, uh, so now I'm a little, little gun shy about planting a tree like that again. Uh, do, do you think a, a live oak would have uh, had a better chance of surviving? It, it's, you know, it's a lot of clay soil yeah. around there. Today, well, so. it, it, it's not the tree's fault. Um, if if you had an established Mexican white oak or an established live oak or something like that, they've got roots all around. So when you get a wet spot, they're they're going to be more able to still keep going. Uh, but this tree has its whole root system. Any new tree has its whole root system, you know, circled up in a little cylinder size. Uh, the size of the container that's now in an underground clay bathtub, right? And so yeah. that that is just, you know, the, the tree has nowhere except right there for the roots to to uh, survive or, uh, you know, help sur help it survive. And and so I think it's more the fact that it's newly planted and flooded than just flooded. Now, Mexican white oak is not a swamp species. In fact, most, most trees aren't. Uh, and it, it's but it's not so sensitive that we worry about, well, we had a rainy year. You know, as long as you've got anywhere near decent drainage and your yard just isn't a giant basin where all the water just gathers, uh, I, Mexican white oak would be fine uh, to plant in that area. There is a, you know, if, if it was an area that uh, does tend to stay wet when we have our normal years where it rains normally, um, there's an, a red oak called Nuttall oak, N-U-T-T-A-L, I believe is how it's, it's spelled. 
uh, and it, it's more tolerant of wet areas than maybe a Schumard would be uh, as a red oak. But I wouldn't stay away from live oak just based on that, I mean white oak just based on that experience. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the call, Ron. Our phone number is 845-5689-979-845-5689 or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I had a question from Shannon, a couple of them, uh, pictures, and one of them is a big old spider with a yellow abdomen and a webbing like you would expect from the book Charlotte's Web, right? But in the webbing, there's this band of zigzaggy white in the middle of it. And that is a, uh, the, I've always called them banana spiders. I'm sure they have a much more proper name, uh, but they, uh, they're they kind of kind of interesting. Uh, if you're not too squeamish, uh, grab a little grasshopper and throw them in the web and just watch them go to work and how quickly and how efficiently uh, they work on that web. But they're one of the types of spiders that creates a web and sits and waits for something to come by. Uh, they're very large and, and uh, for people that are spider shy, uh, probably horrifying. Uh, they're just uh, one of the cool aspects of nature out there that helps us uh, keep the balance of nature in balance. So uh, not a, not anything to be worried. They're not poisonous. Of course, they're a larger spider, and so they do have the ability to bite. Uh, but uh, I've, I've never encountered anybody that was bit by one. I, I would suspect it can be done. Uh, but anyway, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, let's see, we had a question uh, from Jean. Jean is uh, new to the area and bought some hardy hibiscus plants in one to two gallon containers. And he's had them in a container in afternoon shade because of all this extreme heat. And so how do you know when to plant those out in full sun? That's a good question. Uh, I would not plant anything right now. Now we're about to go into, actually we're about to go into a few days where it's uh, well, we can't call it cool, but when you've been over 100 for so long, it seems cool. Uh, but I would, I would wait and I'd take care of them, take good care of them in the container, uh, get them like you've done, uh, uh, Gene, get them out of the, the direct sun, but give them as much sun as you can. So morning sun, if possible, afternoon shade. Uh, and, but make sure and water them once, maybe twice a day. Um, Probably in one to two gallon containers, I'd say twice a day. Water them in the morning, water them in the afternoon. It'll run through, but that's okay. And then when we get a little bit of a break, uh, maybe if the first cold front comes in, and who knows when that'll be, but I'm sure it'll be like the end of September, first of early October, maybe even later, depending on the year. Uh, when it cools off just a little bit, get a little bit of a break. When I say cold front, I don't mean the temperatures go in the 40s. I mean we just get get a break from the heat and we're looking at 80 degrees instead of 100 degrees I'd plant them out then it's going to be less stress for them and they'll they'll establish well over the cool season and I think you'll enjoy the best now when you do plant them out you want to hibiscus want to be in as much sun as you can give them and this is the hardy hibiscus not the tropical type uh, the hardy hibiscus so plenty of sun and that way you'll get plenty of blooms when they take off uh, and start to to uh, produce for you later on our phone number is 979-845-5689, and by email, you can reach us at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I uh, also had an email from Shannon uh, about a containerized citrus tree, and the new growth looks pretty good, and uh, the old growth looks pretty yellowish. Uh, I think because it's in a container and just because of the look of the leaves, uh, you've got a lack of uh, nitrogen and probably at least a temporary lack of water to that plant. When a plant is in a container, it um, dries up quick. And so if you forget to water it even a day or two uh, here or there, you can really set it back and you see this kind of symptom. Uh, mobile elements, those that the plants can steal from older leaves and move to the new growth to support it, uh, will cause the yellowing mostly in the older leaves. It eventually can be through the whole plant, but the first place you see it is in the older leaves, and, and I think this is a nitrogen deficiency. Uh, it doesn't quite look like magnesium, looks more like nitrogen to me. So I think that's what I would do. I would, number one, um, 
you know, step up on the watering a couple times a day even uh, to get it going. If you're already doing that, uh, then provide some type of fertilizer. In a container, the easiest way to fertilize is with a slow release product. Uh, you can get those, you know, organic products are naturally slow release. You don't control the release um, always as well because it's very temperature and moisture related. Uh, and so uh, that's just a factor, you know, to deal with, like how fast it releases in November is going to be different than how fast it releases now. Uh, but that's an option. The other is synthetics, and synthetics uh, are coated products usually. Uh, you put them in, uh, you can't really not very easily burn your plants with a with a slow release synthetic. Uh, now a, a slow release regular lawn type fertilizer that's not I'm sorry a, a re, not slow release regular lawn fertilizer it, you can burn plants with. That's a salt based uh, form of nutrients and uh, you overdo it and uh, you can burn roots with that. But the the slow release the timed release sometimes they're called uh, they gradually over time. So every time you water the plant, a little bit gets washed through and uh, over usually depends on the particular product, but usually in a warm season we figure about three months, maybe four months uh, of release on those. Uh, and so that gives you a nice gradual way to feed it over time. You don't have to think about it, you don't have to worry about it. And you know if you were doing 100 acres of citrus you wouldn't want to buy uh, you know a product like that and put it on, but you got a couple of plants in the backyard. It, a little little jar, bottle, can of it, bag of it will last you a very long time. That is what I would recommend, uh, Shannon, for that uh, particular plant. Uh, I like citrus. They, uh, they're they fun because they, they give you a wonderful fragrance when they bloom and then you get fruit too. So that's kind of fun. All right, let's go back to the phones now. The number again, 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Sayed. Hello, Sayed. How are you, uh, Skip? Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Skip, I, I'm afraid that you may have already answered this question on the thing. I just joined the, the, the show, and if you have, uh, my apologies, but my question is about the roses. Um, I have got uh, many uh, rose bushes. Uh, some of them are knockout, some of them are not knockout bushes, but they're in terrible shape. Uh, Many of them have shed all their leaves, and uh, there's you know, some of the sticks that are now uh, are there, which are some of them are green, some of them have look like they are dead. Mm -hmm. And do what do I do now? Should I cut them down, like I prune around October, November time, mm -hmm. uh, or just leave them alone? Or what's your suggestion? Well, number one is do it whatever you can to have moderately moist soil you know day after day uh, through, through the through the week uh, that's the best thing that you can do for the roses that's in your power uh, so that in the absence of rain that means a good soaking maybe once a week uh, maybe twice a week but once a week's probably enough uh, and just kind of keep them happy I wouldn't prune them just yet uh, usually at the end of August we will take roses like knockout and other um, shrub form roses and we'll shear them back by about a third throw a little fertilizer around them and water it in really well scratch it into the mulch if you've got a mulch there so you know you can get it down at the surface uh, they okay. will they will uh, take off and you'll have a really good October bloom now if you know a, a branch is dead you can prune it off but it's kind of hard to tell sometimes at this stage of the game so I would I would let them tell you how far back they need pruning and you okay. can always come in and removing dead branches can be done at any time we don't want to remove living branches uh, except you know in our winter pruning and then maybe a shearing here and there to cause bushiness and, and invigorate more growth and blooms okay. and how about uh, the uh uh, other bushes, like we have got hollies and things like that, uh, they're, they're looking like they're sick, but again, yes. uh, they're alive, but they're uh, sick looking, you know. So yes. just leave them alone? Or? No, yeah, no. Well, I would get out there, get a little hand spade, and dig down and see what the soil is saying. Uh, is it wet or is it not? And uh, hollies are, especially during the first few years when you're getting them established, they are very particular about not being allowed to get too dry. They also don't want to be in a swamp, but uh, 
they they are needing regular watering, especially during the first few years. Uh, but I, yeah. when you start looking at a holly and it doesn't look good, that's time to drop everything and do what you can for it, because you don't have a lot of warning there. Okay, yep. uh, they, was, they were telling that there's seventy percent chance, but at the moment it doesn't look like it's going to rain. It's as clear as you can see. So well, hopefully it will rain, and <laughs> we don't want to blame our weatherman here. But again, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, it will take a miracle, looks like, for it to rain because it's as clear as it can be at the well, moment. Well, let's all do rain dances and and just be <laughs> real positive optimists because I I'm I'm tired of of looking at dry and dusty. Um, I understand. You know, yeah, that this is uh, this is such a test of patience for all of us. Right? Yeah, that's true. Well, a, a, a native plant enthusiast, a, a leader in the feel back in years past uh, uh, has been Jill Noakes in, in the Austin area and she used to say tawny is a color too and <laughs> so I guess we need to learn to embrace tawny right <laughs> so, oh, okay. all right. <laughs> you take care you do too thank all you right. so much bye bye, -bye. Our phone number, 845-5689-845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu edu gardensuccess at tamu edu uh, So uh, Kimberly e emails about, uh, with all the extreme heat and the stress that our turf is going through, uh, would would I recommend adding compost dressing in the fall if we receive rain, or should you wait until spring? Well, uh, that's a that's an interesting question, Kimberly. And I'm gonna I love to do this, but I'm gonna use it to answer more question than you're you're asking, uh, because it brings to mind some other things. Uh, it, it's always a good idea when you can to add a little bit of compost uh, to the surface of the lawn. Now that doesn't mean I think everybody in town should add compost every year. Uh, but when you do, it does decompose at the surface and gradually feeds the soil. It's not going to be deep. You're not putting two inches of compost over your lawn. But it does cover the surface. And so weed seeds that might be somewhat exposed to light for germination are going to be, in many cases, a little less able to get that light and germinate. Again, compost does not replace a pre-emergent herbicide if you've got this major weed problem in an extremely thin lawn. But it, but it does contribute to that, as do clippings, by the way. And, you know, they, they, anything that's covering the soil is helping a little bit uh, toward that. And so I, I would recommend adding compost. Now, having said that, uh, I, this is a... I, I try to stay with research-based information as much as I possibly can on this, on this show. Uh, because there's plenty of people uh, on social media and everywhere else, and I'll leave it at that, uh, that are putting out not research-based information, but in many cases just erroneous information. And so I try to avoid that. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the edge of that, I guess, right now. Years ago, uh, a fellow named Dr. Koba up in Dallas um, did a study looking at peat moss in lawns to uh, combat take all root rot. Take all root rot is a disease that uh, is an opportunist. Uh, and in fact, we've got a couple of things that I would predict are on the horizon. Uh, number one, our oak trees have a disease called hypoxylin canker that uh, tends to move in when they get very stressed. And they can be stressed from soil compaction. They can be stressed from uh, you know, vehicle traffic over the root system, compacting the soils, and so on. Uh, they can be stressed from excessive watering of our lawns, even. Uh, but uh, I expect that we may see some hypoxylin coming up, and all we can do about that is avoid the stress. There's no treating the tree for hypoxylin canker. In our lawns, take all root rot is a similar opportunist. And uh, I've I talked to a turf specialist years ago who described a situation where uh, one person used a certain kind of herbicide on the lawn that was labeled but stressful to the lawn, uh, and the other person didn't, and it's side-by-side -side yards, and one of them then proceeded with a lot of take-all root rot. It was just an observation they made, but it, it was 
something that stressed the turf. That's not to say every herbicide you use on your lawn is going to do that at all. It's just to say that when turf gets stressed, take all often moves in and gets the upper hand. And has turf ever been stressed uh, this year? And so I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of it going forward. Now, I may be wrong. That's me predicting, not, not a fact. Uh, I may have to eat those words later, but I don't think so. Uh, so, the Dr. Kobos study up in uh, the Dallas area looked at putting peat moss down. Uh, he used one cubic, one bale per thousand square feet. Now, bale is 3.8 cubic feet. It's a compressed brick, and it's shaped like a brick, but it's big. Uh, and it, he, you know, you have to break it up, fluff it up, and spread it out. And that's a whole other thing is trying to get a bale of peat moss spread evenly over a thousand square feet. But they did it and they saw good results and I've, I've got the research from that. I've always kind of taken it with a little bit of a grain of salt like we don't, it's not an official AgriLife Extension recommendation to use peat moss for take-all root rot. But I think it might not hurt uh, to try that this year just because I, I sense that that may be a problem going forward. Uh, so the question was about compost. Now compost a lot of the characteristics of compost are different than the characteristics of peat moss, sphagnum, ground up sphagnum, peat moss, even though both are organic matter. Uh, and so I don't see the research showing compost doing that exact same thing in, in the, what I've been able to find. Another study by another uh, fellow from AgriLife Extension, Dr. Roger Havlock, uh, did the same study down uh, south the east of San Antonio at some golf courses and found the peat moss did, did show some benefit for that. So we don't have a formula. It's not an official recommendation. Uh, I have a little bit of research to support it, and I have a little bit of concern about take all root rot. So there you go. That's a lot, uh, a lot of iffies. But um, Kimberly, I, I don't see a problem at all. Back to your original question with using compost. Uh, this is one when I might consider making that a peat moss application, or maybe try it on some of the yard and try something else on some of the yard and see see if you notice a difference. Uh, I'm gonna try to get some uh, spots where we try that out this fall. Uh, the peat moss applications, just to see if this, what I think is gonna happen, happens, and uh, if, if uh, we get the results we were looking for. Okay, well that was a lot of answer to a very simple question, but uh, hopefully, hopefully that's some food for thought. Uh, let's see, we had another uh, question. Uh, Taryn asked a question about uh, when are bodark trees likely to drop their foliage? It was actually asked for another area of the state further north. Uh, and, and that, you know, that's interesting because I find that different trees drop their foliage at different times. The deciduous trees I'm talking about. Uh, often in August, our, our cypress trees are turning bronze and brown and dropping foliage. And then you get the little re-sprouts of green from the ends of the shoots. Uh, and they bounce back pretty well. Uh, other trees hold on a long time. Someone asked about a Mexican white oak earlier on a call. Mexican white oak has a few leaves in the center of the tree that never drop over the winter in our area. Uh, they just kind of hold on and eventually they fall off, I guess, as new, as new stuff comes in. Uh, but that um, uh, it just depends on the tree. Bodark is going to drop, and uh, you know we're looking at. I think the question was regarding December, and it depends on the season we have. It's hard to predict exactly. I would not have great hopes that you're going to get um, a lot of foliage hanging on well into December as you go f much farther north uh, in Texas. But I guess I guess this year will prove whether I'm. I'm I'm right about that or not. Well, let's go to the phones now and uh, the number again, 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Shannon. Hello, Shannon. Hi, Skip. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Thank you for answering my question about the citrus. It's uh, Yes. I've, I kind of was thinking I was overwatering it, so it's interesting. I bet it's the nitrogen now. Well, it, it could be overwatering. Uh, it, it doesn't look exactly like that to me. So I'm going to say, yeah, the, the nitrogen probably is what, what's missing. Right, right. Okay, well, I have another question for you. I have several volunteer trees from my neighbor's rain tree in lots of places that I don't want them. I've been ignoring them, and now they're about four feet tall and too big to really pull out. Okay. And um, I know you've mentioned this before, but I can't remember what it is. You say uh, to cut it down you yes. know, an inch or two above the ground and yes. then put a drop of... 
Well, <laughs> here we go. Let's a little more than a drop. But uh, anytime you have problems with like woody weeds, and typically it's hackberry, it's you mm -hmm. know some poison ivy vine that's almost the size of your wrist going up the trunk of a tree. Uh, anytime you've got a stump of a woody type plant, uh, mm -hmm. if you cut it and immediately, not the next day, but immediately, mm -hmm. dab a herbicide that I'll mention in a moment. So if you're listening, get a pen or pencil handy. Uh, dab a herbicide on the cut surface. Uh, it translocates in really well and it it does a pretty good job. Now, if you've got a, a very robust, healthy plant and you just do that one little treatment, you may not kill it all the first time. Many times you no. will, uh, but mm -hmm. may not. But it, it, you're not spraying products everywhere. You're not uh, killing other plants in the vicinity. Uh, and, and the dab means all you have to do is wet that cut surface and maybe a little bit the trunk around it. And the product, is, the ingredient is triclopyr. It's T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R. And triclopyr is found in some of the rancher materials that's used for brush control. Uh, okay. it, in a home garden shelf, it may be called poison ivy control, or it may be called brush be gone, or it, it'll have a name, but, but the ingredient is what you're looking for, triclopyr. And you could use it almost straight out of the container. Uh, you don't need to dilute it into a spray form. And I just get a little, one of the little foam paintbrushes you buy at the, at the home mm -hmm. store uh, because you're going to throw it away when you're done. You know, you just, and you just dab it, moisten that, and then dab the surface, and, and then, and that's it. And um, okay. uh, it, yeah, it, it works pretty good on a lot of things. Okay. I have so many of these, and some of them are within like three or four feet of the base of a, 150 plus year old oak tree. Is yes. that going to affect the oak tree? It's not if you just dab the cut surface. Now, if you drench okay. the soil, mm -hmm. you know, you may have some issues with that, but that would be wasting it and, and totally unnecessary. Uh, so right. you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. And I have another question. My mom and I were both noticing that we just have kind of a dearth of butterflies this year. I usually have a lot of sulfurs around my mm -hmm. candlestick and yeah. I have seen a couple of swallowtails, mostly gulf fritillaries, but really not very many. Is there some reason for that? Mm, I haven't heard anything that, you know, I mean, we could always blame everything on the heat and drought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, um, you know, I don't know any other thing. I know there's the, the, the monarch issues that we're very familiar with and, mm -hmm. and so on. But um, as far as sulfurs, um, you know, if you've got a passion vine, you ought to have gulf fritillaries. And if, if um, uh, mm -hmm. there's a number of things the swallowtails like, depending on the kind of swallowtail you have. Uh, but I would just say, don't worry about it. Just uh, make mm -hmm. sure and, and provide them what they need, you know, in terms of larval food source for their babies and adult nectar for the butterflies themselves. Um, don't use BT on those plants. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much for the call. Back uh -huh. to sure. Bye-bye. Bye. You bet. Back to the phones. Let's talk to Kitty. Hello, Kitty. Oh, uh hi. -huh. What's Hope up? you can help me. But I think my, my cause is a hopeless case. Okay. Um, I have some lantana that dewberry vines have decided that they like the area, and they're growing right up in the middle of it. Okay. Uh, and I was going to try what you had suggested earlier about just cutting back pieces and painting the top with, you know, right. brush be gone or something. Right. But they're just so infested in yes. there. I try to do it, and it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to save the lantana, or do I just need to kill the whole thing and start over again? Well, you don't need to kill the whole thing, uh, but you're going to need you're going to need to try to get selective in there and and get that that dewberry out. And w what I would do. Um, if you get some gloves on on your hands, I don't. Is this a big area or not so so large? Well, it's a whole line. I have lantana growing all along the driveway, and about maybe five of the lantana have the have the dewberries in them. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that figuring out where the dewberry is coming out of the ground and trying to dig it up is not a possibility because no, dewberries, they've got roots that will sprout and everything like that. So if it were mine, I, here's what I would do. I would get gloves, leather gloves on my hands, 
and I would try to pull as much of those dewberry vines up out of the lantana foliage as I could. Uh, not not break them off, but just get them get them up where you can have access to them. Maybe put something you know a sheet of plastic or something over the the lantana. Uh, and let those dewberry vines where you can apply something just to the dewberries. I have a little gadget that I use, and it's basically the um, um, oh gosh, the grabber tool you get a jar off the shelf with. You know what I'm talking about? Right. They sell those things. Yeah. And I put a, took a kitchen sponge and cut it in half, and with a bolt and a washer and everything, figured out how to attach it to to both sides. And mm -hmm. I will put in this case, I'd put triclopyr, as I was just talking about, on the sponge. And then just squeeze those blackberry leaves without getting it on the lantana leaves. And mm -hmm. and it's going to be tedious. But if you can get quite a few of those leaves, it's going to translocate down pretty good. Now, these kind of things work best when the plant is actively growing. So if the blackberry oh. is in an extreme stress situation, it's not going to kill it as well. But that way, then give it some time, let it move down, you know, give it a few weeks, cut two weeks, three weeks, and then go ahead and just cut them all off. And and yeah. I think you will have knocked it back enough to where maybe that'd give you the head start on it. Okay. Maybe the upper hand. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. can try anyway, and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I hope that helps. Let me know how it does if you end up deciding to try to do that. That may have sounded like too much trouble, but that that's well, the only I, thing that comes to mind. Yeah, I think it may be, but we, we shall see. Okay. All right, I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. All right, are we open? Oh, we got, okay, we're going to go to the phones now and talk to Jerry. Hello, Jerry. Good afternoon. Afternoon. I've got a question for you. I've got some a barbed wire fence row that I'm trying to get clear of yo ponds primarily. Yes. Uh, and keep them from just constantly coming back. Uh, yes. I've done a lot of pulling with the tractor and just pulling them up as much as I can with the roots. But, you know, there's always some that still come back. Yeah. Do you know of a product or a way to... Uh, knock them back more permanently. Tell me the, 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 the plant again that you uh, said. Yopon. 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 Uh, the, one of the things that can be done is if you, if you use a strong enough solution of the triclopyr, you can do a, what's called a trunk spray. And that doesn't mean a mist that's going everywhere. It just means it could almost be like a trickle coming out of your sprayer. Uh, and you just let it run down the trunk. And Yopon is pretty thin barked. And it, you can get some absorption there. And, and uh, that way you could go down the area and just treat all that Yopon coming up. And I'm sure there's going to be some that's missed. There are probably some that hadn't sent a shoot up yet. And but but if you stayed with that, that would work on that. It's called a trunk spray. And there's a website that Texas A&M AgriLife has uh, called Brush Busters. Brush Busters. And in Brush Busters, it tells you how to control various kinds of brush that are more problematic. And and I think there's one for Yopon on there. I may be wrong about that. Uh, that's a little outside my area of expertise is in you know, brush management. Uh, but um, if there's not, there will be on some of them what they call a basal trunk treatment. And it tells you how to do it and what to do. And you just have to get the concentration of that ingredient right. And sometimes they even mix a little bit of diesel oil in it as the, as the solution that you mix the triclopyr in. Uh, and it makes it stick to that plant. Uh, and they get good results with that. So that's okay. that's where you don't have just like one and you got to cut it off and dab it, but you just got to get through there and cover more area and hit a whole bunch more of them. You can use that that basal trunk treatment. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank uh, you for your help. All right. Hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, anything uh, will help. All right. Good. Uh, Keep us posted thanks. on how it works. We'll, we'll do. All righty. Our phone number, 845-5689. Um, 845-5689 or by email gardensuccess at tamu dot edu gardensuccess at tamu dot edu 
and we look forward to visiting. We've got time for another call or two here today. Uh, now we're going to go to the phones and talk to Barb. Hello, Barb. Hi. How are you? Uh, I think maybe you sort of answered one of my questions. My geraniums, which I swore I'm not going to buy next year, um, because they don't do good when it gets hot, but I've had them in the shade. And I've been gone, so I'm not sure, but I think maybe they were overwatered, but they're yellow. The mm -hmm. leaves are yellow. Yes. That could, that could be overwatering. Okay. All right. I'll assume that's what it is. Yeah. It, mine are all in a lot of shade, more shade than a geranium would normally want to be in. But with this weather, uh, it just we're just trying to keep them alive. And then when it cools off a little bit, they'll come alive again for us in the in the fall and hopefully look good again well i had two up on the porch that i don't think got as much water and they look better so that's one of the reasons i thought might might be too much water mm -hmm. i don't know because i wasn't here doing it my other question is my front yard i have a big pine tree and the grass i don't water my grass but it's um saint augustine is covered with pine needles to the point where I'm afraid maybe it's smothering the grass. Should I rake them up, or is it protecting it? No, it's it's shading it out. Uh, pine needles can build up enough to really shade out the um, St. Augustine and, uh, and other turf. Uh, and so it, it's a good idea to get them out of there. Now, I know the, the thought of going out and raking pine needles um, is probably not one that is very appealing. But if you could find somebody that, that would do that, uh, that would help. Uh, the, getting sunlight to them is important, and pines do shade uh, some, but especially the getting those needles out is something in your in your control. Uh, yeah. Shade, not maybe, so much. Yeah, maybe midnight would be a good time to do that. Midnight uh, would be a great time to do. Give the neighbors something to talk about as if they need anything else, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. What did I have? The, the other thing... I know you've always said leave the aphids alone because the ladybugs like it, but I think it would probably be it need about 10,000 ladybugs. <laughs> the aphids are so bad on the, what is that, uh, plant for monarchs? Um, uh, milkweed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would take well, a, yeah, if, if you're looking at it and you look at it close, and you can send pictures if you want, but... Uh, if you look at it close and you don't really see good guys that are taking care of the problem, like uh, lace wings and lady beetles and parasitized aphids and all that, I would just get a garden hose, hose in spray gun and just blast off most of the aphids. But I tell you, I have seen aphids that are wall to wall on that milkweed, and it doesn't kill the milkweed. Uh, it certainly isn't doing it any good, but it seems to be really resilient and being able to tolerate an infestation that if it were another plant and had that many aphids, it, it would go down. Yeah, it's, um, well, like I said, I've been gone, and those plants have not gotten water, and they haven't died, but, well, they haven't gotten much water at least. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're really dry, and I'm trying yeah. to get that water. But yeah. it's like sticky. Everything in the garden seems sticky from right. all that coming from the aphids, That's and right. I've been and I'm coming in with orange hands, but... <laughs> yeah, I know. I know what you're talking about. Well, I would say the biggest thing is water those plants, uh, and then the aphids would be, if you want to mess with them, just blast them off, and you don't need to get all... If you got half of them off, you're doing a lot of good, uh, but I, I can almost promise you there are probably four or five different beneficial insects that are feasting on those aphids. They're not doing their job, and they often don't. It's, that's part of nature. It's not nice and clean like we want it to be. But uh, they're there, and you're building up their numbers so that when you plant other things, uh, you've got a lot of, uh, we'll call them the good guys around, that are helping out a little bit better. Well, I've found only one of those good guys, but maybe they'll come yeah. in. Well, okay. I, like, I like to compare it to uh, like a fire. If you catch a fire when it's just getting started, you can put it out with a garden hose. If you've got 100 acres of forest to blaze, good luck, right? And that happens yeah. with insect outbreaks sometimes. And, and so there may be all the good guys there, but, you know, we just have too many pests that are reproducing so fast they can't catch up. Right. 
This other question, I don't know if you've heard any over the summer, because I, like I said, I haven't been around, but I had monarchs early, early, because I had some of the butterfly weed that came up early next to the greenhouse, and then they disappeared. And one person lived in the garage apartment said they were climbing up to make, uh, well, thought they were climbing up to make their yes. chrysalis, mm-hmm. and they would fall down, and he would pick them and put them back up there. But anyway, then they disappeared, and I mean disappeared. I saw no monarchs. I saw no anything, and yeah. last year the just Julians. Has anybody else complained about that? I haven't heard that, uh, but there are, you know, things can come in waves, and sometimes... Nature is, like, like I said, it's not an even deal. Uh, there can be, that's why we have epidemics and different things that go through. It's just a, it's a, it can be somewhat, appeared at least, be somewhat random. Uh, but I haven't heard about anything on the monarchs this year like that. Again, though, when you've got this kind of drought, it is hurting the food sources, both the nectar and the larval food sources. And so that would not be surprising to see a problem. And a lot of the the butterfly larvae, or they're also attacked by wasps. Uh, I've watched wasps carry away gulf fritillary larvae off the passion vine and other things. And so there's just a big, you know, give and take out there in nature going on, so it'd be almost impossible to, to know exactly why what you're seeing right. is happening. Well, the reason I didn't think it was the drought is it happened before, you know, yeah. we were dry. Okay. But anyway, I just thought maybe... Yeah. You had it. So that's it. Okay. Thank you for the call, Barbara. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, we're we're out of time for calls, but I do want to answer real quick a question uh, came in from um, Jennifer, and there's some holly shrubs in a row, and there's brown shrubs in the middle, and the others are looking okay, but I can tell they're stressed hollies. I think something irrigation-wise has gone wrong. There is the possibility that it's a root rot, and that would require pulling a shrub up before it's dead, taking it to the Texas Plant Clinic on West Campus, and having them analyze it for possible root rot causes. Uh, they can be caused and are exacerbated by excessively moist soil, uh, but uh, that something is going wrong there. I think it could be drought related, but it could be something else. Uh, also a big patch of yellow, maybe I'll get to this one uh, more next week, but a big patch of yellow grass out in the front. Uh, I would check that closely, bring a sample to the AgriLife Extension Office, we'll give you a free analysis of it. We need uh, maybe a 4x4, 4x6 inch plug of, of soil, and I mean of, of grass and with the soil and roots attached. Put it in a Ziploc so nothing escapes. Uh, we can check for uh, chinch bugs. I don't think that's chinch bugs. Uh, I bet it's a root rot of some sort. I like take all root rot, but we'll be happy to take a look at it if you would like us to. Well, thank you so much for listening. Tell your friends about Garden Success every Thursday at noon here on KAMU, and we look, vis- we look forward to visiting with you again next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch Produce Market and Garden Center, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.